I am really excited about our uh, guest speaker today. She is an extragalactic astrophysicist. So like, you know, you look at those dots in the sky at night. I don't know if you've noticed those, but like, <laughs> good chance those are from our own galaxy. She's like studying what's outside of it. She's also host of the podcast Everyday Einstein, and she works on ALMA, which is the world's largest uh, telescope in Chile, and she was named the 2014 L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Fellow. Uh, she was also the featured speaker at um, the Sunday Assembly at the Reason Rally in DC. Uh, so we love her, she's awesome. Please welcome up Dr. Sabrina Steerwalt. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So thank you for having me. I am an extragalactic astrophysicist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And today I want to tell you about a breakthrough in our understanding of our place in the universe. A discovery that serves as a cornerstone for mo all of modern astronomy and something that informs the research that I do every day. So how many people here have heard of Edwin Hubble? Okay, well, we're not going to talk about him. <laughs> How many people have heard of William Herschel, discoverer of Uranus? Yeah? Fun fact, in 1781, William Herschel proposed that he name his newly discovered planet George, after the King of England at the time, King George III. So we could have had Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and George. <laughs> but we're still not going to talk about him. So most of us have heard of Edwin Hubble. Many of us have heard of William Herschel, who, uh, who recently, hit a man whose contributions to astronomy have been honored by naming a far infrared space-based observatory after him that operated until 2013. Now how about, how many of you have heard of Henrietta Leavitt? Some people, but not nearly as many. So Henrietta Leavitt is the reason we know that the universe is expanding. She's the reason we know that we sit in a fairly massive galaxy that looks like a flattened disk in a spiral arm about halfway out. She's also the reason we know that 80% of the matter in the universe is made up of something entirely different than what you and I and the Earth and the stars are all made of. Something that we're forced to call dark matter because we still don't know what it is. Now, how can the work of one woman tell us all of that. Well, let me back up. How, who knows why we have two eyes in our head? Is it for symmetry? In case we lose one? Yes, it's for depth perception. So having two eyes, that's fine, shout it out. <laughs> uh, having two eyes gives us two sight lines on objects around us so that we can observe their position relative to the more distant background and judge their distance. Now, astronomers, thank you, Michael, that works. Uh, astronomers use a technique to measure the distance to nearby stars, a technique called parallax, which is basically a version of having two eyes in your head, but on a spatial scale the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So we measure the position of a star relative to distant background sources, and then we wait six months for the Earth to travel to its opposing point in its orbit. And then we observe the star again six months later, and we see its position has shifted relative to the background sources. Now, parallax may seem straightforward enough. All you need is your nearby star, some distant background sources for reference, and a little bit of patience. But the problem with parallax, or the difficulty with parallax, is that that shift is very, very small. So the closest star to our solar system, the, so the star that gives us the biggest measurable shift, is Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri, the shift is one arc second. I tell you guys are fans of arc seconds. So for those of us who don't think in arc seconds, an arc second is the angle subtended by a dime as viewed from two miles away. So, pretty challenging. In the early 1900s, we had figured out 
that the Earth and the Sun were not at the center of the universe. But we hadn't yet figured out our position in the galaxy and our galaxy's position in the universe. We also had no idea that the stuff that you and I and our Earth are all made of is nothing like the majority of the, the matter in the universe. We couldn't know any of these things until we had a reliable way to measure distances to astronomical objects. Now, parallax was a great tool, but because of the difficulty of that measurement, in the early 1900s, we had only measured the distance to about 60 nearby stars using parallax. So we needed something better. Well, at the time, Henrietta Leavitt was doing one of the only jobs that were available to women who wanted to work in astronomy. She worked cataloging stars. She, her boss at the Harvard, uh, at the Harvard Observatory, uh, at Dr. Edward Pickering, he hired a group of 80 women to do this cataloging work. That group included Annie Jump Cannon, Cecilia Payne, and if you don't know who they are, we can talk about those next time. So it was said that Pickering liked to hire women because he wanted number crunchers who wouldn't do any thinking. <laughs> the, this group of women were known as the Harvard computers, but also as Pickering's harem. Stay classy, right? <laughs> so luckily for science lovers er everywhere, Henrietta Leavitt did do some thinking. She monitored images of our nearest extragalactic neighbors, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, to look for stars that fluctuated in their brightness over regular intervals. Now such stars, such stars are basically trying to find an equilibrium. So they're trying to balance the gravitational force pushing them inward with force from radiation pressure pushing them outward. But these stars known as variable stars keep missing that equilibrium point. So this results in very easily observed pulsations or fluctuations in their brightness that vary over periods of days to months. Now Henrietta Leavitt cataloged and monitored over 2,400 variable stars. That was about half the entire variable star population known at that time. And in her work studying these variable stars, she noticed a particular type of variable star known as Cepheids that uh, showed a pattern. So the brighter the star, the longer that pulsation period. This was huge. So you see, astronomers, we don't always know how far an object is. So when a star appears dim, we don't know if it appears dim because it's actually intrinsically dim, or maybe it's just far away. So knowing the distance to that object, that star, can tell you how intrinsically bright it is. But also, conversely, knowing how intrinsically bright it is can tell you its distance. So basically, Henrietta Leavitt showed that you can take an easily observable quantity, the period of the pulsation of this star, and translate that to an intrinsic brightness using her relation, and then you can know its distance. <laughs> so Pickering, her boss, published her work this period luminosity relation under his own name. <laughs> this was around uh, 1913. Uh, you guys threw me off, whoa. Uh, <laughs> a year later, uh, the Danish astronomer Einar Hertzberg, Hertzsprung, excuse me, uh, calibrated her relationship by measuring independently a distance to some of those Cepheid stars in the Milky Way using parallax. Two years later, Harlow Shapley uh, used her method to measure the distance to several star clusters in the, in the Milky Way to figure out that we were in a flattened disk about uh, pretty far from the center. Now this was a pretty big breakthrough because our previous understanding of what our galaxy looked like was this. So this is a map done by William Herschel and his sister Carolyn, who looked at over 700 sight lines to map out what the structure of the Milky Way looked like. But as it turns out, 
this is, this is what, uh, more close along the lines with what Harlow Shapley found. And so it turns out that we're not actually that close to the center of our galaxy. We're about halfway out in the disk. And our star is just average. So 10 years later, Edwin Hubble used her method to measure the distance to Andromeda. At the time, we thought Andromeda sat right on the edge of our Milky Way. But it turns out, from Hubble's observations, uh, using Levitt's relation, we found that Andromeda is actually more than two million light years away. So the universe is a lot bigger than we thought. And then Edwin Hubble pushed this work to other galaxies beyond our backyard, and he found his own relation. He found that more distant galaxies are moving away from us at faster speeds. So this is the mathematical manifestation of an ever-expanding universe. So not only is the universe bigger than we thought, it's getting bigger by the day. So knowing the distance to a galaxy unlocks a whole wealth of information about the galaxy, including its mass. So if you know the distance to a galaxy, you can estimate its intrinsic brightness, and that can give you an estimate of how many stars it must contain, and thus its mass. So 20 years after Levitt's discovery, uh, the American astronomer Fritz Wicke noticed that if you added up all the mass from all the stars, from all the galaxies, in the coma cluster of galaxies, it totaled only 1% of the mass that sh is required to be there to hold that cluster together. In other words, that cluster shouldn't be a stable structure. We should see galaxies flying off in all directions. So Zwicky proposed that there must be a new form of dark matter that exists in the cluster to hold that cluster together. Matter, because it inspires gravitational attraction, but dark, because it doesn't interact via the electromagnetic force, like the matter, the normal matter that we know and love. It doesn't interact with us or with our detectors. Astronomer Vera Rubin later showed that the same is true within the galaxies themselves. So stars orbiting in the outer disks of galaxies are moving way too fast to be held there by the mass that's represented by the visible matter alone. So knowing the distance to these galaxies helped us understand their, their mass, and so then we could understand that the majority of the matter in the universe can't even be bothered to interact with us. So Henrietta Leavitt was known as the woman who discovered how to measure the universe. She's a woman who changed space and time. Her work was so important that the mirror, the size of the mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope was designed specifically to be ideal for measuring Cepheid variable stars. A key project of the Hubble Space Telescope was observing Cepheid distances to 18 galaxies. This was the main focus for the first decade. Every single other discovery was just bonus. So without Henrietta Leavitt's work, we would be profoundly lacking in our understanding of our place in the universe. And yet, she wasn't allowed access to research roles. Her boss published her work under his name. Shapley barely mentioned her. It wasn't until 1925 when a Swedish mathematician, Josta Leffler, wrote to Leavitt, Levitt and tell, uh, to tell her that her work was so inspiring that he wanted to nominate her for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately, Harlow Shapley, who had become the director of the observatory by that time, had to respond to Leffler to inform him that Levitt had passed away four years prior from cancer. However, Shapley very helpfully suggested that he was the true deserver of the nomination <laughs> because he had been the one to interpret Levitt's results. Now, lest we think that this is simply a thing of the past, uh, all we have to do is look to the stories of Rosalind Franklin, who didn't receive proper credit for mapping the structure of DNA, or Jocelyn Bell Burnell, whose advisor won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of pulsars, these rapidly rotating neutron stars that take nearly twice the mass of the sun and cram it into a space the size of Manhattan. 
tw only 22% of PhDs in physics go to women, are earned by women. And that participation fraction only goes down the higher up in the ranks that you go. And this fraction is increasing, but at a snail's pace. And this improvement is only seen for white women, not for any other minoritized groups. Now, science isn't the only field where progress for women has been excruciatingly slow. We just happen to be really good at it. So what needs to change? Well, as a woman in a male-dominated field, I'm often given advice, usually by my purported allies, on how to be successful. When you give talks to appear confident, stand with your legs a little bit farther than shoulder width apart and your chest out. <laughs> yeah, this is working for me, right? <laughs> Lower your voice an octave so it's not annoying to the male ear. <laughs> Don't ever mention that you have children. Don't have children at all. Oops, too late. <laughs> if you let Greg propose your idea, the director will be more likely to listen. When you talk to the dean, make sure you wear something low cut. So what all of this extremely poor advice has in common is the underlying expectation that I should be the one to adapt. The culture of science has been created, developed, and written by men. So if women want to participate, we have to play the male game. And women of color, LGBTQ women, uh, disabled women, they're forced to hide even more of themselves. But as many people in this room know, approaching a problem from diverse perspectives actually inspires more creativity, and it's ultimately more productive. If we want progress to happen, we have to be willing, we have to be able to recognize when we're holding on to constructs of our own making and be willing to let them go, even if it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Ironically, this has been always at the foundation of scientific research. It's just the culture of science that lags far behind. And although slow, we have made progress. Not far from here, the Palomar Observatory didn't allow women until the 1970s because they were considered a distraction. And yet I was able to spend many, many nights there, and the majority of my dissertation was using that telescope. Women are now principal investigators on NASA missions. We pursue independent research as staff scientists in national observatories. Now, I think I have the best job in the world. I get to ask questions about our universe and then try to answer them. But we have so much left to learn about the universe that we need everyone we can get to ask more questions, to seek more answers, and to wonder more if we ever have a hope of uncovering those secrets. So I am grateful to the women astronomers who came before me, and to women everywhere who refuse to accept the status quo. To women like Henrietta Leavitt, and Cecilia Payne, and Jocelyn Bell Burnell, I say thank you. Thank you for unlocking these doors so that I can have access. Now let's put a door stopper in there, or better yet, break down those doors altogether. Thank you.